attending during nap time, I appreciate. Uh, I'm sure many of you have ever seen uh, tutorials about how to submit a patch set, right? But have you ever seen a tutorial about how not to submit a patch set? I'm sure that exists, but uh, anyway, the title of the presentation is wrong. Actually, it should be uh, how to submit a patch set, uh, actually knowing it won't be applied. Or uh, how to submit a patch set even when you think it's going to be applied, but actually it won't be. And why? Are you confused yet? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not as much as I am. Okay. <laughs> to shed some light on, on that question, I'm going to make a tour on my uh, personal favor uh, favorite failures. I had many of them these uh, last years, so uh, I'm starting with the most recent one. Uh, this is going to be about lazy RCU callbacks. So, uh, first of all, uh, what is RCU? Um, I'm going to do a brief summary. I know that Paul is on the audience, so this is going to be a risky exercise. <laughs> okay, so uh, RCU is a synchronized synchronization mechanism. So far, so good. Uh, that mechanism allows readers to run concurrently between them and allows readers to run concurrently with writers. So it means that unlike locking-based synchronization, you have races. It's just that those are controlled races. So how it works? Um, an updater changes the value of an object to some new value. Then it waits for a grace period. A grace period is a time frame during which uh, readers might still see the old value of the object prior to the update. And at the end of that grace period, the updater is guaranteed that no remaining readers is dealing with the old value prior to the update, right? And after that grace period, the updater can dispose of the old value. All right? So the typical use case, uh, the, the most famous one is when you, really, you want to release an object, but you want to make sure that this object is not used anymore because nobody wants to de reference uh, uh, a pointer that, to an object that has been freed, right? So a, an updater uh, changes the value of a pointer to a new object. It keeps aside the old uh, object. It waits for a grace period, after which it is guaranteed that no object is seeing the old object. And once it has that guarantee that the grace period has completed, the old object can be released, right? OK. This is implemented using RCU callbacks. So when the updater changes the value of uh, the pointer, it skews a callback to be executed uh, upon the end of the grace period. And that callback is going to release the old object, right? And this callback has its own life cycle. So CPU 0 here is the update side. Right? It has changed the point of value. It queues a callback and then starts the whole uh, callback life cycle. The callback is moved to some wait list. Wait as in wait for the grace period to complete. It notifies some obscure case thread, which is called the grace period case thread, which starts the grace period and completes it. Once CPU 0 sees that the grace period has ended. It moves the callback to some ready list, ready as in ready to invoke, and then it later invokes it, executes it, right? Uh, so this is what you have on most kernel configurations. But on some cases, uh, you have some slightly different behavior. This is called RCU offloaded callbacks. 
uh, on this kind of configuration, you can you can have that with uh, a K config. It's called RCU no CD. But I'm going to use the offloaded callback uh, term because I think it's a little bit more obvious. Um, in that case, the callbacks are queued from the update side, right? Still on CPU zero. But then the callback lifecycle is going to be handled with a K thread which is the offloaded part, right? So here, CPU zero queues a callback. It wakes uh, some new kind of case thread that is called a no-CB no case thread. That case thread is going to put the callback on some wait list, notify the old grace period case thread to start a grace period, wait for it, and then execute the callback, right? So what's the point of doing that uh, offloaded life cycle. Well, there are two use cases. The first one used to be, and it is still uh, the case, uh, is CPU isolation. Some CPU don't want to be disturbed by kernel code. They want to, uh, well, some workloads want to run a user space code uh, without any kernel disturbances. So um, having this offloaded a uh, callback lifecycle to a case thread allows the CPU not to be disturbed by timer interrupts that pull all the time handling the, the callback lifecycle. Uh, the second use case is for power saving. So for example, this is used by Android. So this is not actually a corner case, but uh, you know everything that is not a distro for me is a corner case. Um, so in the case of power saving, the point is that a CPU that has callbacks cannot enter into deep idle mode when it goes idle. Because as long as it has callbacks, it has to keep a timer interrupt polling all the time, checking if there are callbacks to, to, uh, to handle and execute at the end. But if you run with RCU offloaded processing, the CPU that has pending callbacks can just, well, say, I. I I don't care, I have a case thread handling all that. I can just go into deep idle mode. And the case thread is going to handle the callback lifecycle and execution. And about that part, because, well, we still have that load, right? That's going to be into a case thread. So that's actually still a CPU busy somewhere, but it's up to the scheduler to, to do the appropriate placement of those case threads to optimize the power saving. So this is again on use cases like Android, for example. There's just a big constraint, because otherwise we would have that kind of RCU offloaded processing everywhere, right? Even on distros. The problem is that we have poorer performances when we run into that mode, because, well, we have more context switches, right? Because we are differing all that load to some case thread. We are not anymore handling that to software queue uh, vectors, for example. And also poor performances because, well, we are not running that anymore on the local CPU, the CPU that queued the callback. So we are moving callbacks away. It means that we are trashing some cache somewhere and we are using locking also. So it's a trade-off. If you want more power saving, and you can cope with some performance issues, you can have that mode. Otherwise, uh, rather stick to the, to the um, usual behavior. Now comes a new thing about those uh, RCU callbacks. You can classify RCU callbacks into two different categories. Um, the most common RCU callbacks can wait. They don't have to be executed right away. They can wait even seconds because, well, most of them, for example, are just uh, K-free things, like just um, um, RCU callbacks that release memory. And if you don't have any memory pressure, then yeah, those callbacks can wait, I don't know, 10 seconds, why not? On the other hand, you have some callbacks that aren't could be tagged as synchronous because they wake up some code that rely on the completion of, the, of the, that RCU callback somewhere. This is the case for synchronized RCU, for example. 
So those callbacks have to execute quickly. For that, you use the API call RCU hurry, the new, new thing. All right. The point of lazy callbacks. Because you can wait for them to be executed, you can wait several seconds. That improves power saving again. Because the CPU can go to sleep when it has callback queued. And also, it can defer the wake up of the no CBK threads. So that's a whole power saving improvement. So here is, so yeah, it has been implemented on offloaded callbacks only, right? So here is how it looked like. Now, we have CPU zero queuing the callback, arming a timer, waiting 10 seconds, then the timer fires and uh, wakes up the NoCB case thread, which in turn wakes up the gray spirit case thread. So lots of levels of indirection, but um, you get the idea, I guess. So I was thinking, th this has been merged one year ago, and when I saw the patch set, I just said, why don't we do that everywhere? Why only on the offloaded case? Why don't we implement that also when the callbacks life cycle happen on, on, on the same CPU, which is the most common case, right? Because that could benefit also in that case, right? It could, since a CPU can go into, into idle mode with lazy callbacks queued, right? Doesn't need to wait for them to be processed. Then that's a lot more uh, entry into deep idle mode, right? So I tried that. This is how it looks. Uh, so roughly like before, CPU zero queues the callbacks, arm the timer, the timer uh, um, uh, eventually handles the, the callback life cycle. So I expected really great power saving improvement and performance improvement as well, right? And this is what showed the early measurements. I was really enthusiastic because I saw like uh, more than 5% power saving improvement. Like I was really excited. And I realized after two weeks that it was due to a bug in my performance measurements. So uh, hangover, because I uh, realized after what that it was only a little bit less than 1% improvement on some rare workloads involving lots of RCU callbacks queued. It was an IO based workload. And it made things worse otherwise like adding 3% penalty on uh, performance, even on power saving. The reason for that isn't clear. I think this is because we, uh, I had more soft tire queues uh, deferred to a threaded case of tire QD. I don't know exactly. It, it was really hard to, to know why, because essentially it was just noise, really hard to analyze. So it was like three weeks of, I think actually it was roughly one month of work. Uh, especially if you, I, if you include the, the power measurements. And in the end, I only sent a V1 because I couldn't justify the performance, uh, nor the power saving improvement. But in the process, I learned a lot uh, into RCU internals. Right, the callback life cycle management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was not all for nothing. Second case, uh, not my favorite one. The big software clock. Okay, a brief reminder about software queues. Software queues are uh, what we traditionally call bottom half uh, part of the interrupt. Um, well, by that, uh, what is meant is the part of the interrupt code that can run with interrupt enabled, because that part of the interrupt takes a, can take some time, right? So 
So that code runs with hard interrupts. I wrote disabled, but this is enabled. Uh, that part, that, that code is not reentrant, which means that soft IO queues cannot interrupt other soft IO queues. They are not preemptible. They run always locally on the CPU that queued them. And um, it's divided into several vectors. We have networking soft IO queue vectors, RCU, timer callbacks, execute in that context too, uh, block as well, and tasklets, which uh, deserve a, a whole talk of their own, okay? So I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about them. Um, so this is actually a very old mechanism in the kernel with very ancient semantics. And the problem with software queues is that a vector running blocks everything else. For example, a networking vector blocks the timer vector. So if you have a lot of packets to process uh, by the networking code, during that time, the timers are not going to execute. And RCU callbacks, neither. And block, uh, neither. Tasklets, and so on. So that's the first thing. Vectors are not interruptible by other vectors, and they are not preemptible. And the only API that exists to protect against um, soft IO queues is an all or nothing disablement. This is the infamous local BH disable, which is a big hammer. Like it's, it, it disables every vector. So this is to protect against locking, right? So here was a, a first proposal to, to solve the situation. Instead of having that all or nothing local BH disable, why not pass a specific set of soft IQ vectors, right? Instead of disabling all vectors, like, for example, networking code that worries about being interrupted by a networking soft IQ, could just disable the, the specific um, networking soft IQs, right? If, if it doesn't fear a timer, if it, if it can live with a timer interrupting its code, then why would we bother blocking the timers? So I tried that. There, were, there has been around uh, three versions of that. It was a big, pie, big patch set. And uh, even Linus gave me some advice. And on the V3, suddenly he said, oh, by the way, what's the point of that? Because <laughs> the problem is not actually the, well, a non-RT. The problem is not actually uh, those soft IQ disabled areas. The, the real issue is long-lasting vectors executing, such as networking, which block all the rest. So the problem is not the soft IQ disabled code. The problem are the vectors themselves, right? But that's for non-RT. On RT, both are our problem. So I gave a second attempt on that. And this time, um, the rationale is that many vectors, many, for example, the timers, many timers can be soft interrupted by other vectors, most of the time. There are just a few exceptions within the, um, the networking uh, subsystem because there, there, there are timers that interact with the, with the networking subsystem. As for the rest, most of the timers can just be interrupted by soft IO queues or interrupt other soft IO queues. Uh, so yeah, I sent a proposal and uh, Sebastian from the RT uh, project told me that, um, and what if a networking soft IO queue tries to cancel or wait for the completion of a timer. Then you have some sort of deadlock because the networking uh, uh, vector can interrupt the timer vector and wait for it to complete, which cannot happen. So there are several 
issues to sort out. And I'm, I'm not even sure this is the, the right way to, to solve the situation, but I don't know. Future will tell this. I, I just posted that one month ago, so we have plenty of time to, to realize. So eventually the aftermath of that is that I spent more than two months and I still need to justify the design and I'm not anywhere near the end of that. But in the end I learned a lot on soft IQ handling and all the subsystems that use the soft IQs. RCU, timers, uh, you know, already. And I had to d dive into log depth internals, which is uh, a good experience as well. And also that triggered some debates and some counter proposal on the RT front because RT, RT, the, the, the situation is a little bit easier to solve on the RT side for some reason, but I only have 35 minutes, so. And here is my favorite part. Um, no hurts for CPU sets interface. I've been working on that since uh, four, ten years, I think. Okay, again, a brief reminder. No hurts fool is about shutting down the tick uh, everywhere. Mm, so this is a typical typical tick layout, right? The tick is is the yellow bar. This is a CPU. The tick fires every milliseconds if you have a 1000 hertz kernel, right? So every milliseconds, except when the CPU goes idle. In that case, the, the tick is, can be stopped because there is just nothing to do. So no hertz fool push that one step further and stops the tick everywhere. But there is a big trade-off because obviously the tick has, is there for a reason, right? It's, it's there to maintain the preemption, to maintain the um, G fees and, and timestamp progression, and it, it, it does a lot of things. So all that load has to be moved elsewhere to some CPUs that uh, are considered uh, sacrificed. So this is really for extreme workloads that require one or a a specific set of CPUs, precise, in which they run very critical workload that really cannot stand any disturbance. And the other CPUs inherit from the load for uh, all the job that need to be performed uh, on behalf of the tick that disappears on those CPUs, right? So of course there is a big a performance uh, trade-off to consider here. How do you define a set of CPUs to be no hertz full? So this is performed through a kernel parameter, no hertz full equal, then you pass a CPU list. Uh, and this can only be tuned on boot time. So once this is defined with the kernel parameter, you cannot change that afterward. And at the time in 2013, people asked for a way to define that on runtime as well, and asks for a CPU set interface. So go into CPU set, define a set of CPUs, and you can tag them dynamically, no hertz full or not. And believe it or not, but this has required a lot of changes everywhere because um, the TIG has tentacles on so many subsystems, timers, scheduler, uh, RCU, of course, uh, everywhere, everywhere. So this a massive amount of change, actually not that massive, but very invasive, I would rather say, is required for that to be done. So I have been working on uh, preparation work for that over the years, until I realized uh, that nobody asks for that feature for around seven years. I was like, uh, do we need that actually? Uh, because nobody seemed to, to, to 
give any pressure for that feature. Ask, I ask around the, 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 to the CPU isolation users. They are very private, so it's always hard to know what they need. So I asked them, so do you, we still need that CPU set thing? They said, oh yeah, that could make things easier for us. But just that, you know, no pressure, no... Uh, I haven't replied to them the fact that, because I only realize now that the ratio benefit maintenance burden is going to be really big. So we better really want that feature and not just think that, well, okay, it might make things easier. And because there is no actual pressure to get this in, I'm starting to consider I'm going to hold that off and uh, wait for, um, I don't know, future time if anybody suddenly needs that. But for now, I think I'm just going to drop that. And this is a 10 years project. It's, it's really hard to, to mourn, finally, something that you've been working during 10 years. But in the end, all that work made me dive into RCU, uh, made me uh, starting to tackle into the offloaded callback work, uh, into timers, into many areas. So absolutely no regrets. A last example, I don't think I'm going to have the time to talk about it. How much time do we have? Remaining? Okay. I'm not going to enter into that. But it would have been funny because we would have explored the SRCU memory ordering. <laughs> Maybe next time. Okay, so why does it happen, all these failed patch sets? So there are several reasons. The first one is that uh, the first one I didn't wrote it. I didn't write it down. The first reason is that it, I specialized into that. So this is first of all a personal thing. But I don't think I'm alone. And I think that the fact that the kernel code is becoming increasingly complex. I remember I started working on the kernel. In 2008, and by the time I was just a student, it was uh, kind of affordable to uh, dig into the kernel. You had to spend a lot of time, but it was possible. I think that nowadays um, it's really hard if you don't have at least a little bit of experience on, on operating systems, kernels, low level code. I don't know. Do you see students working on the kernel today, except perhaps researchers? Yeah. Yes, there are? How many? Arguably not that many, I think. Now it, okay, okay, they still exist, I think. I, I think to a large extent it depends on the universities. Uh, when, when I got to university in 1994, I was taught ADA, I was taught um, 68K assembly. Um, kids these days at universities, I find, are being taught Python and other higher level. I mean, I, I, was, I was also taught uh, not, um, Prolog and, and Haskell and so on, but um, I don't see I, I don't see students these days being taught lower level languages. Now, may, no. may, maybe Rust is going to make a resurgence of, of people being taught how to program at a level that involves pointers existing and having to allocate your own memory and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but if, 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 if they're not being taught languages that let them write kernels, it's hard for them to study <coughs> kernels. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's indeed another reason. But anyway, ah, Paul? Merci. Uh, I think that uh, these days there are students you can find digging in the Linux kernel. Um, Sorry, don't hear. There are students you can find digging in the Linux kernel, but yeah, uh, they're are. perhaps uh, more dedicated, more crazy, more whatever adjective you want to use yeah. than they had to be 20 years ago. Exactly. They still exist, they still exist, but they are rare, right? 
I also think that just hardware is getting getting more complicated as well. Exactly. That's so not only the cordless, the four, but the hardware as well. The hardware as well. Yeah, yeah, the hardware as well. You're right. So yeah, kernel code is becoming increasingly increasingly complex, and the hardware as well. You're right. And also, uh, the use cases have broadened a lot. So if, for example, you manage to optimize one use case, chances are that you're going to break another one. And of course, it was already true 15 years ago, but today, I guess, it's even more true. And also, subsystems grow in stability. Uh, you know, the, the best way to get involved in, into into the kernel is to, oh, in my opinion, it's to dive in, into a very young subsystem because there there is always a lot of things to do, bugs to fix, and, uh, may, maybe features to add, and, and things to test. So that's one of the best way to dive into the kernel. And nowadays, uh, subsystems are becoming increasingly stable, so it becomes hard to find an angle to approach the subsystem. So that, those are some more reasons that patch sets may tend to fail a little bit more than they used to be. So what's the point in spending all this time into these failing patch sets? Um, eventually, failing patch sets belong to the subsystem life cycle. Uh, they trigger debates. So you come up with an approach that is not the right direction. You know it more or less. And then you discuss with people. They come up with new ideas. Or they come up with their own patch set, a counter proposal. In any case, it makes things move forward. Unless your patch set is really useless, broken, absolutely out of uh, the context, in that case, it might be not productive, but usually, at least, it has the advantage to uh, uncover an angle that hadn't, be, uh, hadn't been uh, explored. In the worst case, your patch set get ignored. Well, I think uh, some talks previously have uh, explained how to get around that, or not. Um, voluntarily broken patch sets also are more efficient than RFD. RFD are, you know, those emails that you write uh, asking for uh, which direction should I take to solve that problem? Uh, should I solve it that way or uh, another way? Those emails tend to be giant, usually. TLDR, right? And I believe that those are usually usually better replaced by a voluntarily broken patch set. So you, on purpose, take a wrong direction. You put a big RFC prefix on your patches to just to say, I know uh, it's not the right direction. But I post it anyway, just to see if somebody has a better idea. And in that, in that case, of course, just make sure not to spend too much time on that patch set because that would be lost time. And uh, yeah, mention on the cover letter that I know this is broken. Please, somebody has an idea. And usually it's m much more uh, efficient than posting an RFD. And finally, because subsystems are becoming increasingly complex and because they become increasingly stable, they also become increasingly hard to review in read-only mode. And in that case, the best way to review a subsystem is to try to modify it. We, I guess you already know that, but I think it becomes even more true today. And usually, those subsystems most need reviews because, because they are hard to review. They need review. So this is uh, the way I envision a perfect stable subsystem life cycle. One day, 
new contributors come up and uh, try uh, to post a new feature, right? New patch set. Wrong choice of colors, I agree. And oh no, that important patch set actually doesn't work. Oh, that's, that's too bad. So disappointment, right? Hangover. Five minutes. Hmm? Five minutes. Five minutes. Doesn't work. But those contributors gain experience. So they are more enlightened, right? They, are, they have some experience on that subsystem. So finally they say, oh, okay, but maybe we should modify just that little detail and we should better document that. And um, oh, that needs a comment because really that piece is not obvious. And then become, they become more and more uh, experienced to the point that they become reviewers. <laughs> And that becomes dangerous because they start seeing the other patch set posted by other people. So they start reviewing and, oh no, it was a trap. And so they become the maintainer. <laughs> and it makes the subsystem even more stable. So <laughs> there is one more round of that, another maintainer. And and another, another round, and, and it goes in circle forever. So in the end, <laughs> tons of angry maintainers for your stable subsystem. And that's it. <laughs> Question. It's not about RCU, is it? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, just uh, if you have any tips on us for us maintainers on how to uh, more productively re reject patches to produce more maintainers. <laughs> Glad it helped. <laughs> Uh, I just want to say, it, it may be a decade or more before somebody picks up a patch that you said, hey, this was a really bad idea, and turns it into a good idea. So okay. it, it may take more than a decade for somebody to pick up a patch that you said, this is a bad idea, and for them to work, turn it around and say, based on the ideas in this patch, I've now created this really good idea. Yeah. So, you know, just, just because your patch, you, you prescribe some of these patch sets as failures, just because they're failures now doesn't mean they're failures always. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't consider it as, as a failure anyway. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you're definitely right. I, 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 I picked up an idea from Linus that he posted in the 90s, and in, in like 2007, and, and that's now task killable. So, you know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Nobody? Oh, uh, SRC ordering. Questions? <laughs> no? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think that side would be better if you change the green color to yellow. 